gonna say all the words inside my head I'm fired up and tired of the way that things have been No, ooh, the way that things have been No, ooh. Second thing, second, don't you tell me what you think that I can be I'm the one at the sail, I'm the master of my sea Oh, the master of my sea Broken from a young age, taking my soul into the masses, writing my poems for the few to look at me, taking me, checking me, feeling me, singing from heartache, from the pain, taking my message from the wings, speaking my lesson from the brain, seeing the beauty for the Welcome to our MJA podcast. My name is Mark, and I am your host for tonight's podcast. This is episode 8, part 5, the series, Cases from the Deep Freezer. These are unsolved cold cases. A cold case, by definition, is an unsolved criminal investigation which remains open, pending the discovery of new evidence. Welcome to California. Case 1. Missing 14-year-old white female and her 18-year-old white male boyfriend. Missing is 14-year-old Donis Redmond and her 18-year-old boyfriend Michael Griffin. They went missing on March 1st, 1958 from San Pedro, California. Donna Redmond was last seen with her boyfriend Michael Griffin on March 1st, 1958 in Las Vegas, Nevada. The car of the boyfriend was found in Williams, Arizona a few days later. They have never been heard from again. There are only a few details that are available in their case. If anyone has any information on the case, please call the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department at 323-526-5541. Welcome to Colorado, Case 2, Unsolved Homicide. 16-year-old white female Girl Scout counselor was found dead and all indications says it was murder. On August 18, 1963, Margaret Peggy Beck 
a 16-year-old Girl Scout aide was found dead at the Flying G Ranch Girl Scout camp near Deckers, Colorado. The 16-year-old Beck had been sleeping alone in a tent nearby other campers. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Beck's broken fingernails indicated to investigators that the teenage Girl Scout camp counselor, Margaret Beck, des desperately fought her attacker. The FBI collected scrapings from underneath her fingernails after the 16-year-old's body was found in her sleeping bag on August 18, 1963 at a Girl Scout out camp in Pike Natural Forest. The evidence collected 44 years ago could lead to her killer according to a cold case investigator Cheryl Moore of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. That night in 1963 her tent companion Claudia Stride had gone to the infirmary and Beck spent the night alone. The nearest tent was 75 feet away and nobody reported hearing anything during the night. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Office was not notified until eight hours after her body was discovered and valuable evidence was likely lost at the crime scene. Investigators interviewed 105 campers program, aides, and officials. No one was ever charged in the murder. If you have any information on this case, please call the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office at 303-271-5625. There is no statute of limitations on murder. Welcome to Arizona, Case 3, Missing 49-year-old white female. On September 23, 1965, 49-year-old Maria Teresa Ruthling went missing from Scottsdale, Arizona. On September 23, 1965, Maria Ruthling went to work at the Aztec Studio Shop and called home to say she was on her way home. The 49-year-old female never returned home. Ruthling's vehicle was found abandoned in a shopping center parking lot at 20 South Old Scottsdale Road the day after her disappearance with her purse and keys inside. If anyone has information on this case, please call the Scottsdale Police Department at 480-312-6336 or the Phoenix Police Department at 602-534-2121. Welcome to Georgia, Case 4, Missing 25-Year-Old White Female. On October 14, 1965, 25-year-old Mary Shotwell Little went missing from Atlanta, Georgia. Little was employed as a secretary at the CNS Bank and had been married to a bank examiner for six weeks at the time of her disappearance. Her husband was ruled out because he was out of town on bank business, but he was due back the next day. On the evening, October 14, 1965, Little purchased groceries and she shared dinner at the Piccadilly's cafeteria with a bank co-worker. The 25-year-old white female, Mary Shotwell Little, was never seen again. Little had mentioned to the co-worker that she parked her car at Lenox Square. Little's boss phones security at Lenox Square asking them to look for the 1965 
metallic, pearl gray, mercury, comma. Security soon notified them that no such car could be found. Little's boss drove to Lenox Square on his own to search the parking lot. He located Little's car in the parking area. Police found a fine coat of red dust on the exterior of the car as if it had been there on a dirt road. They also found blood in several places. Also found the car, carefully rolled together, placed between the seats, was a set of women's undergarments, a girdle, slip, and panties that had tiny drops of blood on them. On the floorboard laid a black bra and a section of stocking that had been cut neatly. Tests indicated the blood probably was Little's. The undergarments definitely were hers and they had been recently worn. The car was also littered with dozens of other items including Coke bottles, a pack of Kent cigarettes, which is Little's brand, and four bags of groceries. One of Little's friends told investigators that Little had expressed fear of being home alone or being alone in her car several days before she disappeared. Authorities also learned that Little had received roses from an unidentified secret admirer shortly before she vanished. Co-workers remembered that Little was disturbed by phone calls she received at work. She never discussed the conversations with anyone. A gas station in Charlotte showed Little's card had been used in the early morning of October 15th just a few hours after she was last seen at Lenox Square. The card was used again several hours later in Riley with what appeared to be Little's signature. The gas station attendant in Charlotte, North Carolina recalled a woman with a cut on her head trying to hide her face, traveling in the company of a man who seemed to be giving her orders. In Raleigh, North Carolina, the attendant told of a bloody woman with blood even on her legs was traveling with two men. No further leaves was found about her disappearance and little has never been found. If anyone has any information on this case, please call the Atlanta Police Department at 404 Eight five three three four three four. Welcome to Florida. Case five: missing 15-year-old white female. On May 13, 1972, 15-year-old white female Judy Lynn Davis went missing from Jacksonville, Florida. Judy was last seen on May 13, 1972. The 15-year-old went to the movies with a friend as, and has not been seen or heard from since. Not much has been said about this case, like who was the friend and what movie house did they go to. If the police have anything, they haven't released what info they might have or do have. The last documentation is the JSO missing persons case file was in 1993. In 2009, a detective tried to reach a family member for a DNA sample with no luck. Just, but JSO said with new information, the investigator will try again. Judy's parents are deceased and she has at least one living sister. If anyone has any information concerning this case, please call the Jacksonville Sheriff's Department at 904-630-0500. Welcome to California, Case 6, 
missing six-year-old black female. On April 27, 1973, six-year-old Tracy Lynn Davenport went missing from San Rafael, California. Tracy Davenport was last seen on April 27, 1973, leaving the motel where she lived to go to school at San Rafael Kindergarten. The six-year-old never attended school that day and failed to return home. From the motel, Tracy walked alone to school, and it's not a long distance. Police were always waiting for one witness to come forward that saw what happened to the young six-year-old female. That witness never came forward, which was very strange that no one saw anything and her route to the school has a lot of foot traffic. Tracy was rumored to be buried on the motel property. In 2009, police was finally able to drop a rumor from their checklist. In 2009, police assisted by the fire department searched the crawl space near the motel pool but did not find any human remains. The only other lead they have ever came from a witness who reported a black or dark green car that was slowly following Tracy on the day she went missing. If anyone has any information concerning this case, please call the San Rafael Police Department at 415-485-3055. Let's take a pause for the cause, and when we return, more on the series, Cases from the Deep Freezer. This is Episode 8, Part 5. Let's take a pause for the cause. MJA would like to give a special shout out to the Corbin Connection on YouTube. Mr. Corbin is a very funny man with his three alter egos. Once again, that's the Corbin Connection on YouTube. Thank you. Now back to our MJA podcast.
Welcome back to our MJ podcast. This is episode 8, part 5. The series, Cases from the Deep Freezer. Welcome to Idaho. Case 7, Missing 12-Year-Old White Female. On May 5, 1975, 12-year-old Lynette Don Culver went missing from Pocatello, Idaho. Lynette Culver left Almeda Junior High School on her lunch break and was last seen boarding a bus at Hawthorne Junior High School. The 12-year-old Culver was last seen boarding the bus by the bus driver and several of her friends on the afternoon of May 6, 1975. Culver was never seen again. Lynette Culver is a confirmed victim of serial killer Ted Bundy. He admitted to her homicide right before he was executed in 1989. If anyone has any information concerning this case, please call the Pocatello Police Department at 208-234-6100. Welcome to Florida, Case 8, Missing 41-Year-Old Black Female. On April 22, 1976, the 41-year-old female Marjorie L. Phillips went missing from Fort Myers, Florida. The 41-year-old Phillips was a mother of four and was last seen in Fort Myers, Florida on April 22, 1976. She was heading to a bank in downtown Fort Myers with her boyfriend, but no account activity was recorded that day and nobody has seen her since. Witnesses then said the couple was spotted driving north on US 41. If anyone has any information concerning this case, please call the Fort Myers Police Department at 239-321-7700. Welcome to Alaska, Case 9, Missing 18-Year-Old American Native Female. On May 14, 1980, 18-year-old Karen Dean Evan went missing from Anchorage, Alaska. Karen Evan was last heard from in May of 1980 in Anchorage, Alaska. Karen spoke with family members several times a week and was looking forward to a visit from her sister living in Canada. If anyone has any information regarding this case, please call the Anchorage Police Department at 907-786-8500. Welcome to Colorado. Case 10, missing 29-year-old white female. On April 7, 1982, 29-year-old Linda J. Barker went missing from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Linda Barker was last seen on April 7, 1982, leaving her residence in Colorado Springs, located in El Paso County. The 29-year-old female was driving a white and blue blazer. Colorado license plates UA 6471. Miss Barker has never been located. She was reported missing on April 12, 1982. Her body has never been found, but detectives believe she is a victim of foul play. Her family told in- investigators it was unlike her to be gone without contacting them. If anyone has any information concerning this case, please call the El Paso County Sheriff's Department Office at 
520-7225. Welcome to Arkansas, Case 11, Missing 16-Year-Old Black Female. On December 4th, 1985, 16-year-old Jeffrey Lynn Smith went missing from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Lynn was last seen walking home from school on December 4th, 1985. Her aunt was the last one to see her with Lynn's boyfriend at the time, Frank Hanna. The two of them were walking on Silver Street in Hot Springs. Frank said they had parted ways and she kept walking. At the time, she was considered a runaway and authorities were slow to investigate her case, even though she was a minor. Police questioned her boyfriend right after her disappearance, but they did not press him further. Two months before her disappearance, Jeffrey had received an opal ring as a gift for her 16th birthday, which she guarded as if it was one of the crown jewels of England, says her sister, Lisa Murray. The family discovered that the opal ring had been pawned, and they believed it was pawned by Lynn's boyfriend. Thanks to Lisa's persistence, the authorities reopened the case. There have been a number of searches conducted in wooden areas, but Lynn's remains are still missing. If anyone has any information regarding this case, please call the Hot Springs Police Department at 501-321-6789. Welcome to South Carolina, Case 12, Missing 23-Year-Old White Female, Dale Boxley Dinwiddie. The 23-year-old Dinwiddie vanished without a trace on September 24, 1992 from Columbia, South Carolina. Dinwiddie was last seen at 1.30 a.m. on September 24, 1992 at a local nightclub called Jungle Gems in the Five Points area of Columbia, South Carolina. The Five Points area is located near the University of South Carolina. It's a bar and restaurant intersection popular among college students. The 23-year-old Dinwiddie had spent the evening with friends at a U2 concert which ended around 23.15. Dinwiddie and her friends arrived in the Five Points area shortly after. Around 1 a.m., the 23-year-old female realized she had lost her companions and asked a bar band bouncer if she had seen any of them. He was the last person known to have seen Dale as she walked down the sidewalk towards another bar. Dale Dinwiddie was taking gradual, graduate art courses and living at home with her parents. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact the Columbia Police Department Cold Case Unit at 803-545-3500. Let's take a pause for the cause and we'll be back in a moment with our guest speaker, Miss Callie, who is a case and suspect profiler and researcher for MJA Inc. Investigations. You are listening to our MJA podcast, the series, Cases from the Deep Freezer. We are coming to you from our home office in Plattsburgh, New York. MJA would like to give a special shout out to the Corbin Connection Comedy Channel on YouTube. Mr. Corbin is a very funny man with his three alder egos. Once again, that's the Corbin Connection on the Comedy Channel on YouTube. Check it out. Thank you. 
Welcome back to our MJ podcast. This is episode 8, part 5, the series Cases from the Deep Freezer. We have on the line our special guest, Miss Callie, and how are you doing tonight? I'm wonderful, Mark. How are you? I'm just peachy. And Okay. <laughs> and when you read um, over these cases, what did you think about these cases from the deep freezer? Well, it's a general run of the mill. Um, some things are missing. Some things are, like, besides the people, sometimes there's lots of information that is missing. Um, once again, all that assuming. And in some cases, extraordinary police work. And in other cases, like, totally missing police work. So it's kind of on a scale of 1 to 10. They're, they're polarized. It's like it just goes from one end to the other. The whole spectrum is covered in these cases that you've put out here. And did the ages of the victims surprise you at all? No. No, there's a, you got a, quite a variance of ages there. Um, and circumstances, too. Um, like when you're talking about a 14-year-old um, pinky Donis, uh, Donis Redman uh, eloping with her boyfriend, 18-year-old boyfriend, well, that's not unheard of. I mean, it's, but that age, she's, she's wanting to get married to this guy. And the one six-year-old, well, it doesn't surprise me, but it, it's unfortunate. I mean, it's happening more than we'd like to think it does. Yes, that's true. And what, what surprised me about the, the Redmond case is uh, they located the boyfriend's car in Williams, Arizona, and mm -hmm. there is a couple other cases through the years that their vehicle was located in Williams, Arizona. Oh, and I so, didn't find that. Well, I mean, oh, wow. just, just doing research on uh, mm -hmm. future cases after they disappeared. And, uh, but once again, there's not enough information on the cases to see if they're related in some way. And that's what surprised well, me. What I came across was Little Miss X. Did you read about that? No, no. She was found on October the 31st, 1958. Uh, believed to have been dead nine to 18 months prior, which would, in the nine months, would put her in that category. She had, in her, like, uh, around or near her body, there was a manicure set, the case of a manicure set, and it had um, the initial P on it, um, and then there was, which would stand for Pinky, and the other, which was her nickname, uh, the Redmond girl's nickname was Pinky, and there was also hand-printed R, capital R, um, which may have stood for Redmond. So I found that kind of interesting. Um, yeah. But they did, uh, the DNA um, would sure help in that case. Like the body that they found in the vicinity, they actually um, excluded it from being possibly being her because they thought that this person, well, she had on clothes that were too big for her and the Miss X, or at least that's what they assumed or thought, and um, but they were, if not the same, they were very similar to the clothes that the Redmond girl had on and when she was last seen. And uh, also, what they did was they excluded her because M Little Miss X, her size was variant compared to... Um, the Redmond girl, but 
I mean, DNA would just, you know, it would be fixed. Like, you could, you'd, you'd know one way or the other. But it doesn't seem apparent that there is any DNA. Okay. Well, see, so once, that's a possibility. One, yeah, once again, that's a case where uh, they need DNA from uh, this family family member. Family, yeah, family member. Yeah. And uh, just to get back to uh, the podcast uh, last night, um, mm -hmm. Paula, after uh, she listened to the podcast, and you mentioned about the Hernandez girl and the picture that you found on Facebook, well, mm -hmm. she, it, she was very surprised because she found the same thing, but she didn't know whether to put it in the podcast or not. And so... Um, oh, yeah. So she's doing some more research on that, and just to see where it leads, and it right, and it it just goes to show that both of you was on the same page. Your thinking process was on the same page, and that's good for what we're trying to do here. Now back to this podcast. Do you think some of these cases could be solved? Well, yes, yeah, some of them can. It's just going to have to dig deeper or put it out in the media more there's different ways of doing it some of them you can't uh can we just kind of go on like because i i pretty much followed through on each one of them and i can give you an example of what yeah, i'm go, go what right you want to know there yeah go right ahead okay and the next one case three was uh oh no wait a minute <laughs> everything's moved my mouth has a mind of its own. Okay. Case two um, is Margaret Becky, M Margaret Peggy Beck, who was 16-year-old Girl Scout aide. Yes. Okay. She was found uh, sexually assaulted and strangled in her tent, which she was, it so happened to be alone in that night, which she normally would have had someone with her. And that person was in the sick bay, or whatever they want to call it. The infirmary um, is what they called it. Infirmary, yeah. yeah. Now, this person had to be strong enough to keep her or Peggy's mouth covered, because no one heard anything. Um, I do feel that this is someone who knew she was alone. And the weird thing about this one is that for eight hours... They didn't notify the police. Yes, that's and, uh, that's the thing there. Why did they wait and, that long? And they scrubbed her tent and all of her the contents. They scrubbed it completely before the police arrived. And they packed her suitcase and all her clothes, her belongings. Uh, now, there was mention that they thought she may have choked to death in her sleep because they didn't see anything wrong until, of course, the sleeping bag, like uh, bodily wrong, except that she was dead, um, until the sleeping bag was open. But anyway, um, they took scrapings from her fingernails. Yep. Now, there'd be DNA to be able to check that, but they'd have to check everyone who was there as well, because a lot of people wouldn't have had a criminal record. So to get the DNA, they'd have to go back and check everyone who was there and ask for their DNA. However, um, the, it says the police do believe it was one of those people that was there, but they were not able to pin down enough evidence to prove it. And it said the police have heard that that person of interest is now dead. Now, having said that, there was an article about three Girl Scout campers that were murdered in Oklahoma. I was just going to mention that to you, yes. In 1977, or the articles from 1977. But um, surely they could have gone through the staff or the who was present at those murders or who was present during that time of those murders and cross-reference it with who was supposed to be present or who was present at the uh, at her murder. Um, 
when she was murdered uh, at the campsite. Like, uh, good chance. Uh, it's very suspicious that that happened at Two Girl a Girl uh, Scout. Yeah, that, I, that's why um, I was going to mention it because yeah. uh, it is very strange that. Um, well, let's say if it was one perpetrator that he would pick mm -hmm. Girl Scout camps. And see, that's another mm -hmm. thing about the serial killer, uh, uh, Ron Ocala. He posed as a counselor at, uh, in New Vermont and New Hampshire, and he went by the name of John Berger. And one of the, oh, yeah. one of the killings they got him for in New York he went by the name of John Berger, and it was in, his name was in that girl's uh, date book that they were supposed to meet that day. And and here's another strange twist to that: ten blocks from where this girl was murdered and found, a girl came up missing on the very same day, just ten oh, blocks no. away. And so far, all the research I've done, all uh, well, I've carried as far as I could. Uh, I cannot right. find no connection, but it just seems like being 10 blocks away and he was a serial killer it, and it being on the same day, it just makes sense to me that it could be him because he did kill more than one person in a day before. <laughs> so that stuck out to me. And once again, we're going back to, yeah, he posed as a camp counselor in Vermont and New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also on this uh, this case here about uh, Miss Beck, uh, Cheryl Moore of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office say they are running the evidence and from that article I have not seen any follow-up articles. If it no. happened to that evidence or did it produce anything well, they would they if they have a suspect, they should be able to get DNA from from somewhere, whether it be uh, through ancestry or through something like uh, two three or me two three and me, or possibly from a family member of his. If they have a a uh, person of interest, they should be able to uh, subpoena that. I would think. Yes, there's another thing I said on Ms. Beck's case, it said the investigators interviewed 105 campers, program aides, and officials, but no one was yeah. ever charged in the murder. And then mm -hmm. if, if you uh, read uh, on some other abductions, there's a lot of abductions that's taken place at state parks, and they just vanished without a trace. And mm -hmm. Uh, one, one for instance, there was like, uh, it was a Boy Scout outing, there was like 50 of them in a group, and then they had like, uh, I believe there was around 210 campers out there that day, and they didn't find nothing on that, and not a thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like somebody took him and probably took him out of the area. It was it was a male who was uh, 10 years old. And so that's what I'm saying. These um, camping areas seem to be a target for a lot of abductors and a lot of child killers. Right. Okay, is there any yeah. other case? Well, because it's remote, eh? I mean, but I know what you're saying about the number of people, but when you take the the size of the place, itself it kind of like 45 or 50 people is like a drop in the bucket you know i mean and people are busy they're looking all over they're doing their own thing and they're excited because they're out in the wilderness right yeah. i don't i don't know it's like opportunity knocks right yeah <clears throat> and okay is there any other case uh that well i went to uh the 49 year old this is your number three Okay. Maria Teresa Ruthling. Rub Ruthling, yeah. yeah. Um, and she, you know, I looked at some pictures of her, and she is quite simply beautiful. She's amazingly beautiful. Um, I know the pictures that are on uh, the Charlie Project or anywhere else don't do her justice, but there's some that are just 
she is just drop dead gorgeous. Um, being a woman, I just appreciate the the look of someone who's simply beautiful. Um, her husband filed a legal notice in the paper five days before she went missing, and that's uh, that says that he his name was Pablo, but Paul was suing Mar- Mariah over land in Santa Fe and that they jointly owned. And it appeared in the September 20th, 1965, Santa Fe, New Mexican paper. Now, <clears throat> usually when you go through a divorce, uh, these things are dealt with in divorce court and, you know, you're all your stuff is laid out now he was he was suing her for this property and she had um it was five days before she disappeared and if she didn't file papers or um make an appearance enter an appearance by the 27th of october of that year 1965 Uh then he he would he would uh it would cause a default in he would own the property. Right. Yeah, so that's the thing. So, it, it said that uh, she worked at, a, at the Aztec studio shop and she called home to say she was on her way home. And then they find her yeah. a vehicle abandoned in a shopping center parking lot. And mm-hmm. they give that parking lot address as 20 South Old Scottsdale Road. And it also said mm-hmm. her purse and her keys was inside yep. the vehicle and so right uh so that's that's another interesting thing about the suit and about she had so many days to respond to it and then mm-hmm. she just disappears and well she could too she um like she owned her own business there that was her business and i don't know i just uh it, it just smells of money you know uh, fighting over money. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, you get you take a businesswoman, somebody who's running their own business, working, you know, late at night um, or into the night evening, and uh, yeah, I, I just it's 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 just to me uh, very suspicious. I don't know what they could do except um, I don't know why they wouldn't have leaned on him. It just it's not like there wasn't enough done. In, in, to begin with. In your research on um, this case, did you find out what kind of vehicle she was driving? No. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't either. Like, there's too much missing. They they didn't they didn't do a good job uh, of it. Um, really. Like it's just like she went up and poof in a in a poof of smoke, and there wasn't any. Uh, enough follow-up, as far as I'm concerned. I, I suppose they could still try, but, I mean, the chance he could even be dead by now, you know? Like, he should have been leaned on. Yeah. yeah um, well, the next was, case... Huh? He's 49 years old in 1965, so more likely he probably is deceased. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But anyway, um, case four... Oh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mary shot well little now I went through the whole thing that you wrote and I went into some other things that I could find and um, now one thing I couldn't find is if they combed the home did they check the home for fingerprints did they check the home for any anything else like there's a time frame here uh, between the time that uh, her car was found, you go backwards in that her car was parked during the day the next day in the parking lot. It wasn't there when people arrived for work, yeah, in that mall in the morning, and uh so uh. The car had the blood in it. It had her um, some of her clothes that were folded in between the seats, and uh, the neatly cut 
pair of nylons or nylons and the bra found on the floorboards. Now, to me, that just says, I have control over her. She's not yours. Yep. That's what I, that just is echoing to me. It just is there. And I believe this person was stalking her. And I've also read about the phone calls that she was getting and, uh, and the flowers and all that. Um, it said that a co-worker remembered uh, phone calls and overheard some of them. Uh, one was where she said, she's reported to have said, oh, my computer's going to go to sleep. Sorry, I'm going to have to go and plug it in. I'm, it says I'm a married woman now, but um, if this was merely an unwelcome... They, but they said it was, if this was an un, unwelcome suitor, her suggestion for dealing with the problem seemed odd. You can come over to my house anytime you like, she said, and told the person on the other end, but I can't come over there. Now, that is very odd. Um, yeah. Her hometown, too, was um, Charlotte, and in Charlotte, and that's the place where they saw, and her card was used on the early morning hours of October 15th. Um, and that was just a few hours after she was seen at the Lenox Square. Now, they said that all the signatures that were on her card or she had signed for for purchasing, I'm guessing, gas yes. or whatever. They uh, It was all looked like her signature. Um, yeah, there was one witness who said she was with one man, and then a uh, gas station attendant said there was two men. Well, I'm going to tell you a little story about that. I was thinking that is interesting. Um, because by the time she got to Raleigh, she was supposed to be with two men. Mm -hmm. I think that's how that went, okay? But previously, that was in the afternoon, but previously in the morning, she was with one. Right. Well, somebody had to drive that car back of hers and park it and be picked up. So yeah. I'm yeah. thinking that the second person drove the car back there and then uh, was picked up by the other fellow, and she was in with them. Um, what struck out uh, to me is, okay, the way her undergarments was folded and the way the line, yeah. eye lines was cut, to me, that sounded like an organized serial killer with, um, what's that What's that little disease where they have to have everything in place, so-so? Oh, um, that's a... Um I forget what they call it. it. It's obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. That, that's what it reminded me of. And but then once again, you got to figure. Well, she was seen with one man, then she was seen with two men. So, right. What's the likelihood that it would have been a serial killer who had an accomplice? But that's very unusual. Well, not usually. Um. It's not usually a serial killer that has an accomplice, is it? Yeah, that's unless, what I'm saying. There's not too many. Unless it's a case. mentally challenged brother or something. I mean, that's not unheard of. That has happened in the past. Um, I'm just trying to... Oh, it said also that they learned that the plates that were on that vehicle were stolen and they were stolen taken from North Carolina okay they said it was either that the person was taking bizarre risks and reckless or they were diabolically clever well, anyway the car that, in itself was a very unique car so that that might be possible <laughs> that they did switch the place because of the way the car looked. It was a, uh, matter of fact, it's right here. Um, Not the one she was driving, but the one they were driving. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, her car, uh, well, I just had it here. 
Just a second. Okay, her car was a 1965 metallic pearl gray Mercury Comma. Okay, yeah. there wasn't too many of those around, so that's why uh, they didn't they didn't have her car very long. No matter what happened or how they done it, that car, like I said, they didn't have it very long because it stuck out. And uh, well, and, and they parked it in the in the mall in the morning. Yeah. <clears throat> and see, that's, but that's but the license thing. plate. The license plate that was on the car when um, uh, when they were at Raleigh, that car had stolen plates on it. And see, another thing that stuck out to me, it said her boss called uh, Lenox Square Security and asked about the comma, mm -hmm. and then they soon notified him and said there was no such car to be found. And then right. uh, her boss goes around looking, and he discovers the car. But it wasn't until lunchtime he did that. Right. And so that's that's what I'm saying. That's just, that whole thing is just screwed up. And there's workers in the mall who went to work, and they never saw it there in the morning. So what I'm getting at is I think that whatever they did to her, as far as beating her up, raping her, whatever, was done in her car at that time because if if and I believe there was too many people that saw her in a bloody state um, after right? right with the with the, this man and with this other man um, that's too too much a coincidence not to be real mm -hmm. and she um, she uh, what was I going to say. I just think that that is it's way too much of a coincidence, and and she, um, as far as the car being there, they took it back, or they picked. Uh, they would have had the other car, and the other person would have been driving it to wherever they did their rendezvous right. and beat her, I believe, and that in that period of time, like overnight. Um, this would have taken place. Now, what they did with her, I I don't know. Um, it'd be nice to think she's she was still alive, but um, uh, I don't know. If it was, she'd have been held captive, and it would have been probably just horrible. If you know what I'm meaning. Yes. Uh, one of the witnesses said it was like uh, that. The one man that she was with, like he was giving her orders, and she was very, yeah. um, oh, uh, meek, and she was yeah. bleeding, uh, at that time, uh, this woman said she was bleeding around the head, and then when you get in, uh, Raleigh, the attendant said that she even had blood on her legs. And yeah. So, so you don't know what they were doing to her? Yeah, so something happened between the head injury and then blood on the leg. Yeah. So that uh, that's another thing. Just, and then, you know, you got to look at this in 1965. They didn't have videos in the garage, video cameras, all of that. And no. So, so it's all, uh, as far as security, it's all done by eyesight. And so that's another thing about the car showing up the way it was, because it makes me wonder, was there actual a guard shack in the in square? And if there was, how's come he didn't notice the car pull in later? But mm -hmm. once again, we don't know what the setup was, so. No. Well, they also said, I was reading here, that between Charlotte and, and Raleigh, it's only a two to three hour drive, okay? Right. But her reported sightings were 12 hours apart. So could this be someone that she knew from um, her life as a child or, uh, you know, a, a young adult? Or before she um, got married. She'd only been married six yeah. weeks. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it, it is very strange. Um 
that 12 hour period makes me wonder if they had a or the one person the obsessive compulsive person possibly had a um family um access to a building um or his own building who knows right, right. um yeah, it just makes me wonder about that. Um, they, if they had gone around that area, they may have, with her picture, um, they may have found out more from the general public by doing a media blitz there. They still might, for, for that matter. Um, there still could be people around that would remember that. Yeah. And, uh, and that vehicle that they were in. Because obviously they had a... Um, description of it yeah and there's, yeah uh, there's not too much uh, as, as far as that there's not too much on the other vehicle uh, no so that's what I'm it saying. didn't say anything but if they found out what the license plate was they sure must have had some idea of what it well no I suppose it's a stolen one so what am I talking about yeah you're right well, you know what I'm saying is there's witnesses seeing her with these one man then two men okay yeah you would think in all this that they would uh, give some kind of description of the vehicle that she was in but I have found no research that states that and so that that's well they I'm may saying. not be giving that out I don't know why they wouldn't though I mean if they have some idea of what that vehicle looks like I'm talking about law enforcement they should have put that out there or they still should yeah, that's what I'm saying. If they put it out there at the beginning, mm -hmm. they might have got a hit oh, somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they might have got a pulled over on a traffic stop or something like that. You just never know. And, right. Uh, and then another thing, see, some people are pulled over. And back in that, that day, in the 60s, they done this a lot. Okay, people can be pulled over, and you necessarily don't get written up, but the officer takes field notes. He puts it in his little yeah. book. And so if another right. instance comes along, he says, oh, yeah, you're the person I stopped over here, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a lot of officers use field notes like that to see later on if there's some type of, of a criminal attack. And, uh, and right. so, yeah, field notes is always in a good tool. I don't know whether they do that today or not, but uh, no, I, know, I think they do. I know. I, some I think they do, and then they go back. They use the field notes to go back and make a report. Yeah, I think so. Mhm. Mm so what's the next um, case you want to talk about? The next case is uh, number. Oh, great! I'm plugged in now. Anyway, <laughs> case five. Uh, is the missing 15-year-old Judy Lynn Davis, Jacksonville, Florida, in 1972, May 13th. Now, um, they have no DNA for her. Um, they were trying to find her parents, but they're both deceased, uh, Judy's parents, and she has, they think she has at least one living sister. But so far... That hasn't happened. Now, there's no age progression picture that I could find. Um, and there's, um, Namus says she's strawberry blonde, but her photo shows that she has brown hair. And going back to the DNA, um, they should be able to trace this family back, whether they use some kind of ancestry or other family tree method to find out if there's cousins aunts, uncles, cousins, there's got to be somebody, or even second cousins, it'll all show up in the DNA. Yeah, I said in, 2000, they can use... I said in 2009, a detective tried to reach a family member for, D, for a DNA mm -hmm. sample with no luck, but uh, JSO said, with the new information, an investigator will yep. try again. Okay, it does say her parents was deceased, and that she mm -hmm. has at least one living sister. So I imagine they went to the sister... To try to get the DNA. But there's no update. Yeah, there's never. Uh, it's not entered or anything, and uh, no. And there's no dental records entered, and so that's, no. that's what I'm saying. It's uh, 
And see, here's another thing I got, I was wondering, okay, it says her and her friend went to the movies. Well, it doesn't say what movie or what movie theater. There's no information on that whatsoever. No. And that, no, it's pretty vague. It really is. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Some of these cases, mm -hmm. uh, you okay, like I've seen cases went on Donut, and there might be, under the circumstances, there might be one line, and you're going, well, how in the hell are you mm -hmm. going to track this down if you have no information <laughs> whatsoever? You know, no well, something I've no. Yeah. Something I've noticed on the new NamUs uh -huh. is I don't see any place where they used to say that DNA was and and dental and all that was on file. It, I can't find that now. And the only place I find it is on the donut. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. But I mean, it, wouldn't you think that it would be on the other? Like yeah, the, if, if it's listed in NamUs, what you have to do is you have to scroll down, and it'll say mm -hmm. DNA, and then it'll Oh, I looked, and I... Sample, same with dental records. Um, okay, I looked and looked and looked. I went right down to the very bottom, but I didn't see it, so... Well, then... It, on several different ones. Then but it, it but I went to the Donut on some of them, and it was there. It said they had DNA on file, so... Yeah. I don't know. Well, like I say, NamUs is way behind because of all the missing people, all the unidentified people. And, yeah. Uh, like I said, we talked on the last podcast, they do need more help to get these cases entered, or they're never going to catch well, up because you have people coming up missing every day. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's why um, we try to do our part. I, for, I, I can't even tell you how many cases that we've had in there been a lot. And well, I know. Somebody entered one that I was working on, and I didn't enter it. Someone else did. And I tried to tell them that these things weren't right. There were certain things that weren't right, because I was talking to the daughter, and they wouldn't change it. Not NamUs, but the person who put it in there. Huh? So, anyway, it's just I was kind of taken back by that. Yeah. You know? Like, well, we want to put it in. It sh should put it in right. Yeah, uh, you know. See, that's what I mean. When we uh, send them a case, all you have to do, uh, they assign a caseworker to it. All they do is check out the information, see if it's correct, and then they enter it. And uh, okay. see how we found out about all this. We went through our case files, and we had seven in our case files that hadn't been entered. So we entered those, and it was approved and uh, everything. And so that's what I'm saying. They do need more manpower to get uh, all these cases in because, uh, okay, I look at it this way. On the average case, and with what imp information they do have, it would probably only take five to seven minutes on each case. And right. So that's what I'm saying. If you could get even one person in an eight-hour period to do a lot of damage of getting those cases entered. and But I don't yeah. know their setup. I don't know how, uh, what kind of power, manpower they have and, or nothing no. like that because that's never been discussed. And no. I, haven't, I haven't talked to Todd Matthews in quite a while, and he more or less runs NamUs for the Justice Department. And, right. Um, like I say, so I, I really don't know what type of system they have and how many mm -hmm. people's entering this stuff in the data bank. Right. Well, it would be interesting to know, and I, I, I'm going to say they probably need a much bigger budget. Uh, there's got to be some uh, money coming from uh, Washington. It has to come from there. Um, you can't do it state by state. It's not going to work. Yeah. You have to. You have to. Yeah, it has to come from the Justice Department. Um, it's the only way. And uh, until that happens, it's just going to carry on. Yeah, that's what you know, I'm saying. with working people working and doing the best they can, because I believe Todd Matthews does a very good job. But I, uh, he's you know he can only do he's only one person right right. And he he is he has p caseworkers working 
on on these things as well. And uh, yeah, uh, it's unfortunate. More money needs to be. It would be a good works project. Seriously, make works project. People yeah. need jobs. This why not? You know. Or people that's doing community service. Why not then? Well, that have too. them do that. Yeah. Like uh, we well, had, if we they're a criminal a, element, I wouldn't really want them entering stuff. <laughs> well, usually you know. if you have community service, it's nothing really serious. Yeah. And okay. we, we learned that because uh, we had <laughs> we had a guy up here that I worked with at the factory, and he was mm -hmm. doing community service for drunk driving. And so I just asked him. I said, "Would your probation officer let you do your community oh, service okay. with us?" And we got it approved, and uh, now he's a full-fledged member. After his community service, he stayed on. So Wonderful. Yeah. Well, you know what? It was just when you said all that, and it makes sense, and I, I guess I'm being a little old-fashioned. I'll put yeah, those most, two words uh, most together. Most people on community but, service, it's drunk driving, petty theft, things like that. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not injuring anybody or anything like that. And so... No. I hear you. Well, I was thinking about the, I think it's in California, where they um, take women prisoners who are serving time for, uh, they're not, it, it's not a murder or grand, grand larceny or anything like that. They're, um, oh, probably breaking probation or getting caught with some drugs or well, most of the time having a really bad attitude to go with that. But anyway, they they train them to be um, firefighters oh, yeah. to fight the wildfires. Right, and there you go. And it gives them a purpose, and most of these women are just so different when they get done, like because they are they're being counted on, for one thing, which is something probably they've never been counted on before in their life a lot a lot of them you know and they have a purpose you know this is so important and so if you were to use people that uh need a hand up not a hand out but a hand up to help out that would be great okay and what's um, your next case you want to speak about well i'm covering them with uh, the six-year-old tracy lynn davenport Oh. from um, California who walked to school that day and never got there. Um, there was supposed to be a car in the neighborhood or follow, slowly following her to school, but there's no mention of any follow-up on that. Um, her case basically has kind of, like, just died except for the missing kids who sent out flyers in 2015 and the cold case, cold case blogger who did a write-up in 2015. And there is an age progression of her. Uh, but I don't know what else you could really do over the, you know, the evidence, the whole case file to see if they've dis dismissed anyone or... Um, if there was any DNA, you know, to, to use to find her. Um, they did, this is before, of course, they had DNA, right? So, right. Um, tr tracking. Well, there's one thing that stands out. Someone said in an article that she was undersized for her age. So there might have been any number of Jane Does that showed up who would have been discard like disregard it right. as being her because most people when you put in this and this and this and you say oh well this child has to be because they're this age they probably weigh this much or they probably this tall well she was shorter than average and she was really tiny like um so um they may not have uh considered her as being as being that Jane Doe. And so they need to go back over that whole thing and uh, and check out all the 
Jane Doe's of that time because she could well be one of them. Yes, yeah, so see, that's another thing. They did uh, put one rumor to rest. They searched that mm-hmm. crawl space that was near the motel pool. And, right. And then another thing, the foot traffic on her way to school, and uh, with it being foot traffic, you would think that the same people was always walking that area, and you would think that somebody would have solved something. And uh, just like I said, nobody came forward, and this was in 1973. I, I doubt if there were any businesses that uh, had video cameras then. And so, like I said, once again, it was just like uh, she's just a few blocks away from her home, and she's just gone. And nothing, nothing's been linked to her, no evidence, no nothing. And uh, to me, with the foot traffic and all that, somebody had to see something, and maybe they don't realize it, or they're the type of person, well, I'm not going to get involved, or... Right. Or uh, uh, somebody that had a warrant out for them saw something and they, they couldn't come forward because they weren't. And it's just the whole thing. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, like I said, uh, just a couple of blocks from where she lived. And yeah. that's just very unusual. And, mm-hmm. and then, like I said, it says en route to her school there was a lot of foot traffic. Well, foot traffic in that area, it would basically be the same people almost every day walking that area. Well, well, she was obviously seen walking to school. Right. Or on her way by someone. I don't, doesn't right. say who. But it, because it mentions this car, uh, the dark green car, right? Right. Um, but yeah, it's like it, it just, like somebody put up a roadblock. There's no, there's nothing more. There, I, I tried to find stuff and I couldn't find anything more on her. Like that would tell me that there was something being done. Right. You know, right. aside from people like us, like missing kids, like the cold, cold case blogger, you know, like all those things. But... Unless the police give it media attention, um, it isn't going to get really hammered out in that area, if you know what I mean. Right. Like, focused on that area where people lived, where people would be still looking at their hometown, you know, even if they don't live there anymore, or in that area, or that state, you know. I don't know. I I keep saying, you know, but <laughs> uh, I don't. I really don't know. Well, see, what, um, what bothers me about this in the San Rafael area, once you get out of the uh, town itself, it's very remote areas. And oh. so my thinking is uh, whoever took her, they took her out of town and mm-hmm. probably dumped her in the mountains or in the desert. And finding, finding remains in the desert they've been buried is really hard and uh, I mean yeah there has been some that's been found but uh, you just got a mass area uh, Arizona is a good example you go to Arizona and you're out in the desert and you know there's a body out there well if you don't have a very uh, well trained dog you're never going to find that body because there's just so much area mountains mm-hmm. uh, and most of the desert is sand and it's easy to dig no. up and and then once again you have these um, tumbleweeds this that and the other okay using sand you can bury something and put the plants right back on top like nothing's been disturbed yeah and uh, so yeah well, it, can they not use can they not use that heat sinking to find uh, it, it picks up on carbon uh, well, uh, you know, to fly, that's a, fly over? That's a, that's a good question on that. Um, I've asked certain people about certain equipment, and mm-hmm. a lot of them say to get an accurate reading, it has to be 
while the person's still alive or right after death, okay? Oh, that's not uh, right, though. Yeah, but as far as the carbon dating or um, sonar, okay, yeah, it will pick up certain objects and mm -hmm. uh, especially the sonar, okay? Uh, well, the sonar, it's the radiation that is in, in the bones that right. will show up. Right. Mm -hmm. The sonar would tell you if uh, there was somebody buried out there. And, and matter of fact, they even tell, they can tell you what position it is they were even in. Mm -hmm. Like we done a search one time where we had to dig, and the dog kept hitting around this area. So each time the dog hit, we put a marker. Okay. Once we got all the markers around and started digging. We had a perfect shape of a child in a fetal position, but that child had been removed from that area. Uh, so we, we, know at one, we know at one time she was buried there at one time. Okay. Well, I know dogs can, t they can pick up on the imprint. Like we had a chain here and uh, the one of a previous um, person who had a dog, um, I wasn't around then, but the dog died near that chain. He wasn't on it, but he died near it. And like his body, um, the smell. Now this is 15 years later. Oh yeah. And my, my dog knows that, like he, he just can't contain himself around that chain. So we've moved it because um, we don't want him, you know, getting all excited about that. Yeah, because there, there's yeah. Some, some dogs uh, that people have found out that some dogs that don't even have training can locate remains. It's just something that yeah. they have. And mm -hmm. we was uh, up in the Vermont mountains, the uh, Green Mountains one time, looking for Miss Maitland. And... This dog crosses the road about 50 feet in front of us. Well, he's dragging something to where it looked like a hip and a leg. And so we follow the dog right up to his house. We go in the driveway and everything. Well, he disappears somewhere on the property. So we knock on the door. This guy comes to the door and he says, may I help you? And I said, yes. I said, this is going to sound strange. But I said, we're up here searching for Miss Maitland. And I said, your dog just went across our van, and he had a large object that looked like a leg and a hip. And so he he started he started laughing. He says, oh, he says that's so and so. He's always bringing stuff home. So he went and found the dog. And once we went out there, it was behind the barn. Well, it was a hip and a leg of a deer. But he was so far oh. away from us, we couldn't see that yeah. it was a deer. Oh, my. But, yeah, he, oh. told, he told us that dog was always bringing stuff home. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then, yeah. Well, we, that would have been his pride and joy at that moment. It was a deer lake. I mean, And then you he know. had a case in New Jersey that mm -hmm. a dog, he first brought home an arm. Then he brings home a leg. Oh. And before law enforcement actually located the rest of the body and then people that owned the dog they just couldn't believe it you know because he, he ran the woods there and yeah he's he's bringing body parts to them and they was just did they find the, the the rest of the body yes yes yeah oh my god yeah and see that dog was wow. never trained or nothing it just yeah they just have some dogs just have a sense for it well it's an instinct yeah they are born with. Yeah, and I'm going to move on. Okay. Sorry. Um, just a quick one on Margie L. Phillips. This is really, she, she's not injured in Amos. Um, she's from Fort Myers. Right. And she went missing in 76. And her boyfriend says he fell asleep in the car. And when he woke up, she was gone. Now, wouldn't you think you'd lean more on that? Well, yeah, like, because uh, it, it, uh, states, once again, it states that they were 
her and her boyfriend was headed to the bank, but there was no account activity recorded that day. No, I know. It's just strange yeah. altogether. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the DNA is on file at the police station, but nothing's been entered at, at NamUs. Well, uh, and the police did use the media in 2015 to ask for help, but <laughs> I don't know. There's there's a whole big gap in there. Yes. That needs to get filled in cuz yeah, there's something wrong and wherever he went, he should be hunted down and he should be put in a hot seat. Oh, no Not question. Boyfriend. On that. Yeah, no question on that. Yeah. Now, going on to number nine, we've got 18-year-old Karen Dean Evans. Went missing from Anchorage, Alaska. She was 18, did I say 18 years old? Yeah. yeah. Now, she's in NamUs, but I couldn't find where it said there was DNA. There likely is. Um, but having said that, um, they found... Uh, uh, I can't even say this. They found a Jane Doe, and they've named her U Ulatina Annie. That's probably not pronounced right. And they found her in July of 1980. Um, and her death, they believe, has occurred approximately um, up to a year. Um, she was in her late teens to early 20s, and she was the right size. She was everything. Um, and the DNA of the Jane Doe is available. But I don't see, I don't, I don't know about this. I couldn't see the DNA on, on NamUs for, um, for Karen Dean Evans. So... That would be uh, interesting if they were to um, check that out. Yeah, that would be, because on, on some things, uh, they'll say DNA and it'll say pending, or it'll say DNA not collected. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, that's always, that always got me when uh, it said it hadn't been collected, but uh, we have, for instance, up in Michigan, where mm -hmm. the mother of the victim was on her deathbed, and this uh, Namath is the one that's sending the DNA kit. Okay, mm -hmm. he had it. He had it on his office desk for six weeks. Well, within that six weeks, the mother of the victim died. So they had to end up going to another family member to get the DNA. And now this detective. He is, he's trying to crucify us because he didn't do his job. Because we know for a fact when he got that DNA kit and how long it sat on his desk. without. Mm -hmm. him. And another thing was he was only two blocks away from where he had to go to collect the DNA. Two blocks. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And he's irate with us. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm irate with him. I mean. Well, they always said the best defense is a good offense, so yeah. that's what he's doing. Yeah. Um, now, there is also mention here in uh, 1984, a local baker named Robert Henson, or Hansen, sorry, listed Euclidana Annie, the Jane Doe, uh, as among 17 of the women that he admitted killing around Anchorage. Right, right. So that would be interesting. Yeah, he he's but a real... He didn't know her name, though. He didn't know her name, though, he said. Yeah. Um, yeah. She had no identification. So, you know, you'd, you'd think that, like you just said, but they need to get the DNA done on that whole thing and, and get it dealt with. That That is appalling. Yeah. You know, really. Okay, moving on to case 10 with uh, Linda Bake Barker from Colorado Springs. Now, she's in NamUs. There's no age progression picture. Her vehicle was found a few months after she disappeared at the Denver airport, but they claim that she didn't board a plane there. Right. 
I, th- I think they need to media blitz the, the, the law enforcement on her anniversary of her disappearance or, or whatever, just to, to get it out there again, because someone has to know where she is. Yeah. Yeah, that was um, in uh, 1982, so that's what I'm saying. There was a lot more in progress for missing persons in 1982 than there was in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there was. Yeah. It just seems to escalate, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying with NamUs. They're, the way it's going, they're never going to catch up because uh, people come up missing every day. And so... Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why they do need more manpower to get caught up because they're playing catch right. up. And well, when they started, they was playing catch up. I mean, they tried to get everything entered and done. And I don't know actually the last figure <coughs> that I've seen that they've had entered, but uh, I mean it's up there in the numbers and the thousands. But uh, mm-hmm. there's like, to my understanding, there's like over 200,000 cases left to go. So uh, mm-hmm. that's what I'm saying. It's just we're being overran by missing persons and unidentified Jane and John Doe. And that's another thing is a lot of people don't think of her names being men. And if you look at it, uh, the, the women, the Jane Doe's, they do outnumber the men. So when, mm-hmm. there, when there's remains found, automatically people think, well, it's going to be a woman. And, uh, oh, okay. I mean, that's just the way it is because of the numbers. The, the statistics say, well, more likely it's a woman. But like I said, there's there's uh, thousands of unidentified John Doe's. And, yeah. Well, you know, the numbers are just, they should be unconscionable to someone's mind. It should be so shocking that it would make you sick. Oh, yeah. And see, that's what I'm saying about uh, some of these agencies uh, <laughs> that don't do what they're they supposed to do. Uh, I always say, like, if I find a, a lazy detective on the Missing Persons Bureau, I tell them, uh, do you have kids? Well, yeah. Well, what if it was one of your children out there? Missing? Yeah, exactly. I said, I bet yes. you they, they would be right on it. Well, that's what I say about all these uh, parole officers and judges who let people off with light sentences um, for horrific crimes against children. Um, or they let them out early on parole. Okay. I always say, well, you should, ta- you should take them home and they should live in your house for a month. Yeah. If you can't have them living under your roof, you shouldn't be letting them out in the general public. Yeah. Like early parole or giving them a uh, a two month uh, sentence, you know, like, and then community work or house house arrest or some stupid thing. Oh yeah. You know, I just don't understand that. Um, I'm gonna move on to case eleven, the 16 year old uh, Jeffrey Lynn Smith, missing from Hot Springs, Arkansas, in 1985. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Police work. Um, Her sister deserves an award, but of course, just like every other sister and family member of all the missing people, most missing people, they all deserve an award. Um, She's attended um, a mall information group in 2017, displaying, you know, information about her sister. Um, She's also done a media video clip in December of 2017. Um, Now, um, uh, she went by the name of Lynn, so I'm going to use that name. Um, Lynn has, um, is in NamUs, but there's no age progression picture entered there. Um, But there is one in the Charlie Project, an age progression picture. And um, let me see here. Don't Donat says that there is DNA on file. I couldn't find that on on Namus. Um, now, her boyfriend 
they found out, the, the sister found out, and then took it to the police and convinced them to reopen her case. Um, the boyfriend of, of Jeffrey's, or Lynn, uh, pawned the ring that he had given her, which she totally worshipped. It was an opal. Right, right. Um, and and he, he pawned it after her disappearance. So she wouldn't have parted with that ring without some kind of uh, uh, struggle, to say the least. Um, her sisters stated that the boyfriend was abusive towards her right? and uh, that um, she had wanted to end the relationship. Now, the boyfriend was later imprisoned for assaulting another girlfriend, and he's never been charged with anything or even, I don't even know if he's been cross-examined in Lynn's case, Jeffrey Lynn's case. Like, it's really... Yeah, they didn't lean really on bad. Him. They really didn't lean on him very heavily. No, and no, it was that's like was in in the first place they didn't, and even after they discovered that he pawned the ring that she worshipped like the crown jewels, you know, yep. that's exactly the, what they how they phrased that. I just I find that hard to believe. They need to get their act together. <laughs> if he's still alive, he needs to be. Put in a tank, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah, I call it the um, box. <laughs> the box, okay. Yeah. Well, you don't want to put them in the cider barrel, but you can put <laughs> them in the box. Yeah, we call it anyway. yeah, interrogation rooms, old timers, we call it the box. Now, I always said that if all you had to do with some of these people is put them in a room with about five mothers for about three hours. You will know everything you want to know by the time they're done with them. Oh, but that's cruel and unusual punishment, didn't you know? <laughs> really? Oh, the lights went out. <laughs> yeah. There was power failure that day. <laughs> so sorry. I can't help it. I have. I know. Have I this. mean, I, I feel the same way. And like I said, <laughs> they these suspects have all these damn rights, and it it mm -hmm. just mind boggles me. I mean, especially when you know you have the right person and there's just nothing that can be done. And because, like I said, they're worried about yeah. if they make a case, they're worried about getting it thrown out because of the pressure they use. And mm. once again, I, I really think that if they go back to, okay, when I went in school, was in the early 80s, if they would use some of them techniques, today they would get a lot mm -hmm. better results yeah they would yeah if you start telling that perpetrator and if you have an inkling as to what they've done and how they've done it and you just kind of ease them into a nice little friendship or at least that they think that they can talk to you and then you tell them that you know that they did this and you know how they did this yeah. and you watch them squirm because they will and and then you just keep on and keep wearing them down and eventually they're going to tell you yeah i was always taught never ask a question to a suspect unless you already know the answer if you know the that's answer, right and, mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to make them squirm when you start putting this stuff before them. You start putting your jigsaw puzzle together, yeah. and they're looking in the mirror because it's them. Yeah. That they're looking at. They know that you know. Yeah. And once they know that you know, then their whole atmosphere changes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's I believe what I'm that. talking about if they lawyer up and can't ask them no more questions, <laughs> but you can tell them, hey, this is what we got. You know, that's right. And this, we know this, <laughs> and there's no way around <laughs> it, and you just tell <laughs> them what's going to happen, what type of sentence. And to me, the states that still have the death penalty, that's the most uh, factors that you can use on a suspect is, hey, mm -hmm. you're facing a death penalty, and 
if you are arrested and convicted, this is what you're going to get the death penalty. And yeah, so and this is your opportunity. This is your opportunity to help out. Right, get life right? life without parole. You know, mm -hmm. and so and you know what? There's matter of fact, there's a serial killer in Ohio. That that's uh, David E. Penton. That's what he's afraid of is the death penalty. He's got life oh, without you mean parole, he... but he he <laughs> is afraid of being put to death. So he needs to go. He needs to be sequestered to another prison <laughs> in another state for another crime. Well, see, that's what, that has that's what the we're death saying. penalty, and he will pee himself all the way to the finish line, well, telling you everything you want to know. Well, see, that's what happened in Texas. He had three of them in Texas. Uh, he <clears throat> he confessed to get the death penalty off the table, and uh, so, like I said, he got life without parole on those. <clears throat> but he had already been locked up in Ohio because Ohio first got him. And, okay. Uh, but like I said, he's he's afraid of the death penalty, and we have 17 states that's involved in this, and we keep telling one of these states to step up that has a death penalty. You're going to get yeah. your conviction, and I said, and he's going to give you the location of the body because he he doesn't want to be put to death. He'd rather spend the rest of his life in prison than being executed. So he's playing Russian roulette with this stuff, like he's just. Yeah. His information is his uh, way out. Yeah. And then we have this informant. Uh -huh. um, he gave us good information on like 47 cases. <laughs> I mean, sometimes he would, the informant would have the town, sometimes he'd have the girls' ages. And, <laughs> and then uh, two cases he had, well, it happened in Alabama, it happened five days apart, and I'll be damned if our research didn't find those two cases. And it was just hmm. mind-boggling to me. And all these cases was in, uh, these towns only had one street light, and you blink, you miss them. That was his main target. Oh. Towns like that. Oh. Yeah. I see. And like I said, these, these two towns, was 55 miles apart on the same damn highway. And it happened five days apart. And hmm. so like I said, uh, this informant, he has very good information. He, he helped get the three convictions in Texas. And uh, like I said, he's talked to all these law enforcement agencies just like we have. And nobody has came forward to prosecute him for these other crimes. So. Why? That's well. We know in Boone County, Indiana, on the uh, Shannon Sherrill case, that prosecutor, he is afraid of losing. So that's what, more or less, that's what he told me that it it was so the case was so old he didn't know if he could get a conviction. I said, okay. He asked for a change of venue. Okay, if he asked for a change of venue, it still is going to be held in Indiana, and there ain't a person in Indiana. That's not going to convict that man. And, but, like I said, we can't get that Boone County prosecutor to move on it. Matter of fact, the detective, when he put the case together from our information, he turned mm -hmm. over the case file in February 2007, retired, thinking it was a done deal. Well, here he's uh -huh. working at Harley Davidson uh, after his retirement. Okay, he had never granted an interview to the media before. That, that was the type of person he was. Well, right. uh, Fox News went in there and asked for an interview. He gave him an interview, and they asked him straight out, is, is, do you think David E. Penton took, abducted Shannon Sherrill and killed her? And he said, yes, I do. And they said, does this information come from the informant? And he said, yes, it did. And they asked him, they asked him, did it all check out? And he said, yes. And w one thing I knew about Lieutenant Heck, he would not turn over a case file to the prosecutor unless it was a done deal. Or he just right. would have held on to it and kept working on it. Uh, okay. But that prosecutor, so, he won't do nothing. So is this the same with other cases besides this one? Yeah. Like, uh, like how... 
this prosecutor, he, like I said, he's afraid of losing any case because his father was a big time judge and prosecutor and he's trying to live up to his father's expectations and all this. Well, you know what? You can't do that when you're a prosecutor of a county. You just can't go no. by that. And plus, he's one of these that, okay, good example of me and the victim's father, Mike Sherrill, had a meeting with him. And he looked right at Mike and he says, I hope nobody's promised you anything. Well, I looked across from him and I said, well, I said, that's directed towards me. And I says, here's the only promise that we made to Mike Sherrill, that we wasn't going to stop searching for her until she was located. I said, that's the only promise we made. So I says, I don't know what you're talking about. That's the only thing he could ask that he knew would be harmful to you. Well, what he thought was going to be harmful. He thought, you know, we yeah. was looking oh, yeah. at, we was looking for money and all this. No, we don't look for money. Uh, we don't have to look for money. I mean, that's not what we're here for. Well, there's an old saying about call, uh, um, the pot calling the kettle black. Yeah. And if a person has something, uh, I'm guessing that money is very important to this guy and that's one of the reasons why he's not doing his job yeah. okay is that's what i'm guessing you want to move on to the just next the last one. one there's one other and it's um dale boxley didn't witty uh, now um she disappeared in uh columbia south carolina in 1992 and um going to school there. Um, her DNA, uh, there is an age progression photo on the donut, and her DNA is on file. Um, it says, uh, I couldn't find that on uh, the age progression on NamUs, but it is on donut. And the Charlie Project says, investigators are probing the possibility that Geraldo Javert, known as Ray Rivera, was involved in her disappearance. Rivera admitted to murdering four Georgia women, but is a suspect in many more deaths. He was charged with one killing in 2000. His victim in that case was a police officer. There's a photo also uh, on uh, Donut that... Uh, of him as well and he's a NATO a native of Puerto Rico and he was a resident of Columbia and a student at the University of South Carolina in 1992 um, the university is located near the five points area where Joanelle was last seen investigators are also investigating as to whether he was involved in the 1999 South Carolina disappearance a Paula Merchant, mm -hmm. and I could not find uh, Dinwiddie's uh, case on NamUs. Okay. It wasn't there that I could find. Okay. So that's all I know. Uh, there's one case I didn't mention on here because, um, and I can't even tell you what that is right now, but it, there was so very little right. about her right. that it just didn't even make sense to mention it. But um, I probably, oh, there, Lynette Dawn Culver, right. 12 years old. Um, yeah, missing in 1975. Um, there's, uh, the only thing I can think of there is that carbon sink um, equipment might find her. Um, Ted Bundy supp supposedly... Uh, uh, confirmed that she's a victim. You you had that written there, right, of his? Right, and so that's she's another a, thing of, about him. He had dumping areas, and so they should hone in on those dumping areas to see if she is out there. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they should, because, uh, yeah, there's so many things that, um, and they may if it, have not even discovered some of the dumping areas. Oh, I'm I'm sure uh, 
they have in okay. Sydney with the Green River killer. They say 49 to 50, <laughs> but I bet you it's a lot more. Yeah. Probably the thousands uh, or hundreds, I, I mean. Yeah, I'd say I'd, uh, the way he was going, I'd say at least 200. Yeah. 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 Well, well, and he was getting away with it, that's why, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Callie, thanks for being on tonight's podcast. That's the end of our MJ podcast, episode 8, part 5, the series, Cases from the Deep Freezer. We would like to thank our listeners for tuning in, and we would like to thank our guest speaker, Miss Callie, for being on tonight's podcast. I have two quotes for our listeners. Life doesn't require that we be the best only that we try our best. H. Jackson Brown, Jr. Second quote, If nothing ever changed, then there would be no butterflies. Author unknown. Always remember, folks, if you ever get bored with nothing to do, well, take a walk deep into the woods. You might be surprised what you might find. My name is Mark, and I was your host, and our guest speaker was Miss Callie, and we would like to say to you, good night from Plattsburgh, New York. Told me that the end